Welcome back to another episode of Georgia Sports Nation. We got some more Hawks and Braves content on the way for you guys today. We're going to be discussing the Hawks' recent moves over the past two weeks. Uh, they waived Tyrese Martin, guaranteed Bruno, so he'll be starting the season, and unfortunately Tyrese Martin will be cut from the roster. We got news that the Hawks are going to be playing the Mexico City regular season game versus the Orlando Magic. So we're going to be you know, just discussing uh, what, what, we, what we think about that and, and what it might mean, what my mind mean, mean for the Hawks and it's their international presence. And for the Braves, we're going to be discussing just how, how, how it's gone over the past two weeks with the, with the slight struggle to begin the second half. And we'll preview the Brewers series, which starts tonight when, with Yannick Chirinos making his Atlanta Braves debut starting on the mound. So without further ado, let's get into it. Will, what, do you, what was your reaction to the news that hearing that Tyrese Martin was waived? I was shocked at that, man. I was really shocked because he showed out. He showed out this uh this summer league and um uh, last summer league he showed out. So I thought he was making a step forward. So I was shocked about that, but I'm not surprised really now as you look more into it because we got a lot of wing players. Yeah, we got a whole lot of wing players. So. We I mean, need more bids. We need more bids. And by them guaranteeing, you know, Bruno, that means he's going to get more playing time this season, you know. So yeah. hopefully that's what that means, he's going to get more playing time. But I think I think for me, it, it's – look, all roads at this point point to us trading Capella. So for me, if I, I'm Bruno, th- my mindset going into the season is I might be a backup center in this league for the Atlanta Hawks. I might get a solid 10 to 12 minutes a night behind Onyeka Okongwu, and I need to be ready. That's the mindset I'm going to have if I'm Bruno Fernando. And there is a slight chance the Hawks keep, keep Capella. Now, that is definitely not likely with uh, all the reports we've seen, especially yesterday, with um, or two days ago, with the NBA Central reporting that they're, going, that they're likely to trade Capella again, which we've known for the past, like, well, month and a half. <laughs> but uh, it's... Bruno, I think, can really see see the floor this year, especially as a backup. And I think I think Hawks fans should look forward to that. I know when he was here, when we drafted him, it wasn't exactly the best product on the floor. But he improved in Houston. His shot blocking, he can spread the floor, he can shoot a couple threes now, and his rim running and lob threat is really great. So I think Bruno adds some uh, some depth to that to that uh, backup center position, which right now we don't have. If or we wouldn't have if we didn't keep Bruno and we trade Capella. I'm gonna keep screaming to the rooftop. We do not need to trade Capella. I don't hope. We well we. <laughs> all the, I'm hating all the all the report coming out. I'm hoping it just got done smoke screen, but we we actually make ourselves worse by doing that. I mean, we, we become a thing. smaller team. We become a smaller team. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We become so, a small like, team, and I think on paper, if you just looked at a vacuum, the Hawks do get worse. But – and, and here's, this is this is me coming from a guy that I think Onyeka Kongu is ready to start, but I really love Capella. I mean, I think we're going to miss him so much. We will take a hit on rebounding. I think we will also take a hit on fa- just fast-break defense in general because well, Capella's I'm one of those guys. I'm hoping you're wrong. I'm hoping yeah. you're wrong. I'm hoping they ain't getting rid of him because that – that would not be a smart move. I'm telling you, just try to save some money. That ain't Capella ain't costing you that much damn money. I mean, just I eh, mean, not upwards of twenty, upwards of twenty million. It, it is pretty expensive, but his, his contract ain't long. He don't, he don't got much longer on his contract. No, two two years, I believe. Oh no, this, I'm saying. so he's now. really not costing you a, a boatload of money. And but that, for me, to make your I team, to make your team worse. Just to save a little money, that makes no sense to me when you say you want a championship, but you diminish diminish the talent you have on your team. The reason – the reason well, I go say ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying the reason I say this is because – well, first of all, Click Capella's – let's just call Spade a Spade. He's been a valuable man over the Hawks. I mean, if you if you don't think he should have gotten that extension, I, I think I – don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like he was – in the 2021 season – Clint Capella was top five defensive player of the year candidate. I've had multiple 2020 games. I mean, he was a monster in 2021. Now we haven't seen that same Capella, and he, but he is still he is still really valuable. The thing is, though, 
Clint Capella has a lot of good trade value. A lot of teams could use him. Dallas is definitely among that conversation. The Warriors are in that conversation. There's been reports yeah. that the Clippers are also in that conversation if they look to trade him to Zubac, which I don't understand why, but they've been linked to Capella, which is weird to me. But, hey, uh, I don't know the Clippers. So there are right. a lot of teams that- can use them. A lot of teams like us because we yeah. see – we seen what happened when he was injured last, last uh, when he was going down injured. We yeah. struggled so badly of getting rebounds, and that was with your boy Double O in the game. So that that is a terrible disaster waiting to happen if we do this. It's it's not making I, making much sense to me business wise. If they, I mean, okay, it makes sense to me business wise. Yeah. Business as far wise, as as far as competition wise, it makes no sense to me. I agree. I agree. We we take a step back. But the reason why, if I'm putting myself in Landry Fields and a little bit of Tony Russell's shoes as well, it's it's that okay. Clint Capella has a lot of trade value on the market. We know teams want him. So we have a guy on Yeka Okongwu who is, I think, he's completely ready to start. He's a top six pick, but. If if we trade Clint Capella now instead of waiting until the deadline of his last contract deal or even when a year goes by, now is when he's at his peak value. He's gonna he's he might start to decline soon. He's getting up there. He's not old by any means, but he is getting up there in age. And I think now is the best time to trade him. That's what I would say. That's what I would think is going through Landry Fields' head right now because you can get the most value for him and. You are confident that Onyeka Okongwu can do a great job as a starting center, which I am. I'll miss Capella. Now, I, got a, I worry about what kind of message this saying. You got a player that wants to stay in Atlanta. This the second player that wants. We know John Collins wanted to stay in Atlanta, but he wasn't productive. We know Clint Capella wants to stay in Atlanta. He has said it several times. He's productive on the floor. So this just sends. I think it sends the wrong message to me. Like. We don't care what you've done for us on the floor or whatnot, but if you got trade value out there, we're going to get rid of you. It, 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 it's sending the wrong vibe. Now, I agree with you that Double O is ready to start, mm-hmm. but I don't believe he's ready to start at the five full time. I think he's ready to go at that four, like I've been telling you. He need to go at that four. His body size screen four, four, four. Because five, he's going to get pushed out the hole. We got, a lot of big, we got a lot of big teams out here in the East. Well, we've got. Okay, let's let's think about it. Remember, let's think about it. So we've got. You obviously got the Embiid's of the world. You've got Jared Allen, the Cavs with Evan Mobley, and then you have. Uh, I mean, if you want the Giannis and Brook Lopez, but other than that, who who is has a dominant big that we're like that 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 we'd be really scared of? Hey, the Heat been giving us trouble. Over but the, the Heat, the heat us give trouble. us trouble with Bam Adebayo, who's the same height as Nyeka Okongwu. What about Boston Celtics? Even with old Al Horford giving, giving us trouble. That's so because like, well, that's like... because Clint Capella doesn't <laughs> like to go up the perimeter. If if Onyeka, I will I will say this about that Celtics series. I thought Onyeka should have played more. I think Clint Clint was Clint's a great player, but I think that's a really bad matchup for him. I wish we would have seen Onyeka a little bit more. I, I think we just should have went to more zone. So yeah, but you can't go against the you though. can't go to zone against the Boston Celtics because they have such great three point shooters. You can't do that. I, I live I live with I live with Al Horford bus knocking down the three. I live with him knocking the three down. I can live with that. You don't want the other. You don't want you don't want Tatum and Brown to get hot. And once they start to get hot, they they get hot from going inside out. You feel what I'm saying? They like to drive, then take shot. You know what I'm saying? So they get hot from driving. For me, and for me, it's actually the other way around. Like I'll let Tatum or I'll let Brown get his thirty or forty. But to me, it's the others you got to stop. Well, and and yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think we did a we we did a decent job of that um, in in the games that we won. But in the ones that we didn't, those those other four games, it was it, it wasn't there. But now, last we we uh, we digress there. But if we, like you said, you said we have a lot of wing depth, right? And especially at the two, DeJounte Murray's going to start. We know that. Then we've got Bogey. We've also got A.J. Griffin. Now, A.J. has been linked some to, uh, to some in, in the Pascal Siakam potential trade, which we're still hearing rumors about. Um, but 
Yeah, Tyrese Martin, even if he did make the roster, I think he would be back in the G League again this year. And the only reason I say that is because even if we had one shooting guard that was injured, say say Bogey goes down with some knee issues, we would have AJ to back him up, and then we'd have DeJounte to start. I don't think we're cutting AJ's minutes to give minutes to, t- to Tyrese Martin. I think that would be absurd. What, what is your opinion yeah, on that? Then, yeah, you got um, Sadiq Bay that can play the three. Well, yeah, Sadiq. Well, I'm not. I'm just talking about strictly playing you're the talking two. Talking about the two. You're talking about the two guard. Yeah, strictly two. Okay. Well, yeah. Like, would you would you have wanted to see Tyrese Martin cut into AJ Griffin's minutes this this season? Well, no. No. Okay. Yeah. I, I and mean, that that was some, that was the topic of some conversations a couple of weeks ago, but I I thought that was absurd to be honest. <laughs> no, no, because like it's crazy that they both play the same position though. Like, yeah, the exact. We're so the deep. Exact, at, that's the only reason we're so deep at that position. So it's just like he would have just been a straight bench player if he would he would have just been on the bench. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think, and I wonder if. Oh, and I also also wanted to discuss the signing of of Wesley Matthews. Wesley Matthews, the he's now he's now thirty six or thirty seven year old. Can't remember which one, but he's still thirty six or thirty seven years old. And we know what Wesley Matthews is. He used to be a great defender. Now his legs have you know his age is getting his age is getting up there. His legs are a little bit slower, but he's still an elite three point shooter. But I don't see him getting much playing time because uh, to me. AJ still plays over him. Bogey definitely plays over him. And then DeJounte's there. So I think it was to just to get a good veteran shooting guard for, for a young guy like AJ, maybe Sadiq Bey as well, to to kind of just mentor and be be that veteran presence at that position. What do you think? I think he was pretty much basically just brought in for competition, to ramp up the competition. You know what I'm saying? Like basically so nobody really just get comfortable with their job. You see what I'm saying? Oh yeah, yeah. To to say, oh, this guy could play over me. I gotta step it up now. Right, right. So like, that's what I'm thinking. Is all based on competition right now. With uh, Quinn Snyder, pretty much going 100 in his uh, system right now. We only got to see him 20 games last year. Now he get the whole off season to uh, have the players to work on what he need them to work on in his system. So I think it was just pretty much competition. Competition. Yeah. Okay. West, the thing, thing about Wesley Matthews is if he if we get an injury at the at the shooting guard position, whether that be AJ Bogey or DeJounte, he can he can still slot he can slot in there and provide some minutes at the two if AJ or Bogey ever was needed at the three. Let's say Sadiq Bey got hurt or something like that. Um he can play minutes at the two and still be effective. We know he can splice the four. I like his three point celebration, by the way. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty nice. <laughs> but <laughs> well, with 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 the bow and arrow. But it's. But it. I think. I think it's a great pickup. One, the veteran presence. Two, he's solid enough that he can play with an injury. And then three, we know he, he likes to shoot a lot of threes. He's a catch and shoot guy, and that's what Quinn Quinn wants at the wings. We've seen him in Utah. You know, playing with Boyan Bogdanovich, George Niang, these type of guys that are just. Uh, the, the guys catch and shoot and hoist those threes. That's that the guys that Quinn likes at the two and the three, and I think Wesley Matthews fits that. But yeah, uh, any any other yeah. any other uh, roster roster move uh, stuff that you that you were interested in or wanted to talk about? Oh no, I agree. I agree with that. You know, I just want to see if Quinn how many players will he play. Oh, how, oh, how many players? players? Okay, yeah. Yeah. The, how many well, what's players your, what's your prediction? <laughs> My prediction is he going to do by eight. I'm hoping he do ten, but you know what I'm saying? But I'm th- I'm thinking he's going to do an eight-man rotation. Eight eight is too thin for me. I think it will be nine. What, what did he do eight, last eight? year? Did he do eight last year? No, he did nine because you had uh, – you, you had – Onyeka coming off the bench. You had Bogey coming off the bench. You have Jalen Johnson coming off the bench, and you had Sadiq Bay coming off the bench. That's four. Okay, so that's okay. A long yeah. starter, so that's that's nine. He had a nine right, man so rotation. He did have a ten man. Did have a ten man for a little bit until I. <laughs> so I'm I'm saying nine. I think, 
I think we're going to have um, Sadiq Bey starting at the four. If the roster stays intact the way it is, and this is a small lineup, I know it is, but I think I don't think you can have Jalen Johnson and Yeka Okongwu and DeAndre Hunter all starting uh, uh, at, at in the front court with a pick and roll of Dejounte Murray and Trey Young. It's just the spacing isn't there. And say with Clint Capella, if he starts or if Yeka starts, I think you have to include a shooter in there like Sadiq Bay to space that floor at the four or the three and give. Give a little bit more opportunities for Trey and Dejounte to to kind of work see, work their way in. See, that's what that's what training and preparation come in at, Mikey. When we was growing up, everybody guarded whatever position. We went position, you know, position based growing up. We we went out and guarded the three point line and everything. But now we so position based, we think we need to sit down in the paint, stay right here. No, you got it. Got That's why when if if I'm running a team, I'm looking for athleticism because I want you to be able to move. I want you to be able to be where our weakness at. You know what I'm saying? Well, so, I'm not talking about on defense. I'm talking about offensively. Like when – if you have Sadiq Bay at the four, DeAndre Hunter at the three, and let's say Clint Capella is still on the team, so we'll have him starting at the five. If you have Sadiq Bay at the four, that provides a lot more shooting to space the floor on the offensive end. Whereas if you start at Jalen Johnson, if he doesn't have that three ball, you know, boosted up from what it was last season, that's a little bit iffy of, iffy of spacing in my opinion. But I do. All, all, but yeah, that's still all in preparation. Work on it. These are basketball players. We all shot threes too. We didn't just take it to the hole. Come on now. It's, it's all with preparation. What you what you uh comfortable with at the time. So if you're not comfortable with shooting threes, then you go on your off season. You start working on shooting threes so you can get comfortable with doing it. You know what I mean? So it's basically building that muscle membrane up. If you build that muscle membrane up to uh. To build that confidence of you shooting a three, then you'll you'll be more likely to shoot that three without hesitation. You see what I'm saying? So that's all it is. It's all it's all in preparation. Like you know, like Kobe used to say, "Hey, take no days off." Great, you know what I'm saying? You, you really yeah. take no days off. You work on your craft. You perfect your craft when you're in this when you're professional league. So with Jalen Johnson, so if you had Jalen Johnson starting at the four, would you have Jalen Johnson starting at the four currently? We know there's a gap at the at the four since John Collins was traded to the. You Jets. already know who I have starting. Oh no, you have a Kongu. You have a Kongu starting <laughs> yeah, at the you four. Yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I have starting at the four. Yeah, you got a, a Kongu starting Jaylen at the Johnson. four. I, I have Jalen Johnson being the backup to a Kongu. Okay, I, I mean, why well, I already voiced my opinion. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I don't think we'll see a Kongu at the four. Uh, this year, actually, but I mean, who knows? Maybe, but for me, for me, I think it's Sadiq Bay right now. Jalen Johnson, would get the- I like him better at the three. I like Sadiq better at the three. Here's the here's because the at the four, he's Bay. small. He's small on defense at the four. He's small. He is small on defense at the four. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree with you. But at the three, he's also really slow. He can't keep up with the wing, the perimeter wings and guards. Hey, guess what they go back to, Mikey? Well, you used to talk about like <laughs> defending your position. They go back to preparation, Mikey. You better go train with the track bar. You better but go I don't think you can bar. turn. You can, <laughs> I, I agree. I see what you're saying. You like teach, off, you can teach season, speed now. Yeah, you can teach speed. The, you can't teach heart. You can't teach size, but you can teach speed. The they off teach season speed is every where, day. Yeah, the off season is where you know the players will. Pick up, pick up some skills or refine some skills that they already have, but I just right. don't think you can have Sadiq Bay become this guy who can keep up with quick guards and wings in one offseason. It may take one, or it may take like a couple. I think, especially, especially if we're trying to become that next level top, um, top seed, top tier seed, and uh, playoff contender. Especially, you know, we wanted to get home field advantage this this year, unfortunately, and, and multiple Hawks said that at the beginning of the season. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. But for me, I think. So, yeah, so Mike, let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. So, if I gave you a uh, a five million dollar incentive for you to go work on work on your uh, feet work, you wouldn't go do it. Oh, of course, I'm going to do it. But well, I just hey, don't. Exa- exactly. Money can you do like it enough? <laughs> can you do it enough to be to be like sustainable over 82 games? That's well, the hey, we don't we don't system. need him to be all pro. We just need him to be that little that little nagging. Fruit fly or uh, net out there, you know, just move, be in their way, get in their way. 
stick stick with them. I mean, to your help come. That's all I, I need you to do. That's all I need you to do. Yeah, I hope he can. I'm I, I'm just not I'm just not sure about it. Well, I've been and and in fairness to me, I may have a little bias here. I'm lower on Sadiq Bay than a lot of people, but <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> hey, and then I'm just saying. I look at it like the strength from the strength standpoint. If we have him at a three, that that's a strength for our offense. You feel what I'm saying? That's a strength. It's a strength for all. Yeah, it's a strength for our for offense. For the offense, right? But the, but the defense for me is where we need to improve more this season. And, and defensively, need, he's better at the four than the three. I think. We just need him. Hey, if, we just need him to be uh, available, aware. I mean, we need the offense to know that he's out there. Yeah, yeah. I need yeah. you to be. You know what I'm saying? Get active hands. That's all I need you to do. Get active hands. Be at the spot. Make him change. I mean, shooting is all about um, what you call. I don't care. I don't care. About <laughs> shooting is all about you know um, rhythm. So if you knock him off his rhythm, you got to make him reset. That 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 takes down the percentage of him making that shot. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's that's all I need you to do, man. That's all I need you to do. Gotcha. Um, and I did, I did also wanted to bring up the fact a little bit here that, you know, the Hawks are about to play a game in Mexico, uh, in Re- Mexico city in the regular season versus the Orlando magic. Uh, what were your, what were your thoughts on that w- when you heard that? And do you, do, what do you think this does for an Atlanta Hawks and, uh, international fandom? Hey, it is, it, it, it's great. Though. I think it's great. It expands our fan base. We got so much hate in the city right now. Like, we need more fans somewhere. If our own city going to hate on it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> our yeah, own that's nice. yeah we, I mean, we it. got people in the city who, who want to trade Trey Young for, like, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, and two first-round picks. Like, <laughs> come it's on, crazy, man. man. It's crazy. It is. It's ridiculous. So, what, I, yeah. Wherever I we can get those loyal them. fans in, I want them. Give me the loyal fans. Y'all can have all these fair weather fans. You can keep them. You can have them. Give me the loyal fans. Yeah, uh, exactly. And we even in in Twitter spaces right now. If you go in, I know there's there's a couple of Brazilian fans that frequently come to our spaces at Hawks Fan TV. There there are a couple of UK fans as well. So we know we know the Hawks have some international fans, but this is the this is the way to really to really get it uh, to really get it on the map and. Really right. get our players. And, and, you know, more you support. know the NBA chasing that money. So, whatever they, uh, somebody tell them they gonna give them a, a large lump sum of money for them to come play in their country. Get what? They gonna be out there. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. And then, and it, and it expands the brand. You know, so it widens the market when they be looking for talent. So you got now if you get um people in Mexico more familiar, more familiar with the basketball game. Now you got more talent to choose from you know yeah and, and you know adam silver has expressed this uh, in multiple times to the media you know he's wanting to make the game more international obviously basketball basketball in america is is what it is the highest level right now but you know you got euro league you've got you've got the french league the spanish league the chinese basketball association is pretty big too uh, so the, this game is definitely an international game and when you can have more people wanting to achieve their dream of making it to the NBA and impact and impact more people outside of America. Like we're seeing with now the top players in the game, you see Embiid, you see Jokic, you see, uh, you, you see Giannis, they, they Shea Gildas Alexander, even with it in Canada, you, you got these guys, these foreign players who are at the top of the league at the moment, Luka Doncic. I forgot. I can't believe I forgot him, but yeah, you've got these guys who are at the top of the league. And everybody wants to emulate them. Now, the biggest way to do that is to expand your international presence. And I think this is a good move by Adam, Adam Silver. You get to bring a bo- you get to bring a box office superstar to Mexico City like Trey Young, who's definitely going to want to put on a good performance there. And Orlando's going to know that as well. Paolo Banquero is going to want to as well. So it's it's it, I think it's going to be a fun game, and it's and it's good and it's going to be an interesting atmosphere. I'm I'm interested to see what it, some international fans. How it's like, because you know we've been to some NBA arenas. Obviously, I've been to some Hawks games. Like we know what the, the vibes in, that, in State Farm Arena, like when the Hawks are playing well. 
But what is hey, it going to be in an objective, at an objective uh, location like Mexico City? Even though you know Orlando is closer to Mexico City than Atlanta. Well, then again, they're going to be uh, like that in season tournament going to be good for the league too. Going to add yeah. a little more juice, a little more juice to the league. But as uh, far as it being into, in Mexico, come on, how much money are they going to make for it to be in Mexico? It's going to be packed. It's going to be sold out. Oh, you yeah. know what 100%. it's going to be. They don't have basketball games like that every day in Mexico like that of this statue. It's going to be sold out. Yeah. And you, you, you brought up the in-season tournament. I, It's kind of tough for me. I like the idea of an in-season tournament. But for me, I'm just like, eh. I mean, it's there. Play, for the players, I think it's going to motivate them to stay healthier, though, which will be really good so they can play more games because there's a – I think it was $50,000 extra if you do win um, per player on the team if you do win that in-season tournament. So they're going to have some motivation to do that. But as far as the seating and seatings and groupings and how it's done, I'm I don't necessarily hate it, but I'm not in love with it either. That's that's kind of my take on it. Well, well, you know, this is a test drive. They print they tinker yeah. with it and get it get it better. You know what I mean? So the the thing that killed the NBA is this in game management stuff. They let these players sit down. Like I like the way how Michael Jordan them used to think. Like. I'm coming out every night. I'm gonna play because somebody might might could have bought or uh, spot they last they last dime to come see me play. But I'm sitting on the bench. I'm coming out. I'm give all my all if I'm able to play. He played with a flute. This man played with a flute. Come on, man! Like all this game management stuff, you can you can game management a player by with him playing. You can sit him down, you can sit him down a couple minutes, but not sit him down the whole game. Yeah. I see what, yeah. Well, I, 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 see really, what you're I really don't like that. I really don't like that. All right. Any any other things you want to mention about the Hawks before we uh, switch over to the Braves here? Oh, no. We, we good. I'm, I'm rolling with the truck. Let's roll. All right. The Atlanta Braves. Now, we know the Braves had a historic and absolutely amazing month of June. Historic numbers, home runs, average, OPS, all those offensive numbers across the board. Now, in the second half, the offense has struggled a bit. It's been, I would say, I wouldn't say it's been something that you should be panicking over, but we have been a little homer happy, and we really haven't scored as many runs over the past few games. What is your level of concern uh, with the offense right now, Will? You already know I'm concerned, Mikey. We talked about this before they went to the All-Star break. Me, you, and Ant had the same conversation. Had the same conversation, man. Now they coming oh, out trying to swing for the fit. Right. Now they coming out. We still suck in runners and scoring position. We really need to get that together before we start the postseason. Or uh, it's gonna hurt us. I know, I know you 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 were saying our pitch is okay because our ERA and stuff is uh is we got the one of the top ERA, but that could be skewed. You know what I'm saying? Like you got the you got the the eye test don't tell you the same, you know. So you got to look at the the ERA of the pitchers and the, what the eye test is telling you. And the eye test is telling telling me something wrong. And it's not at the panic of like red alert panic, but it's like at the point where we need to pay attention to it before it become before it become a thing. Because we know baseball is, is a game of stretches, and we don't want to go on that cold stretch for too much longer. You know what I mean? We need to start winning some series back again. And like, and not, and not start a trend of losing series. You know what I mean? Yeah, we we've only actually won one series after the All Star break, and that was the Brewer right, series right. on the road. <laughs> and yeah, it and yep. to and we almost lost that one. Yeah, last uh, sorry, not last night. Wednesday night's loss against the Red Sox, three runs. Uh, again, against the Red Sox, one run. The Brewers, we won with four runs, lost with three runs, won with six runs. Then against the D-backs, we lost with 13 runs, we lost with three runs, and then we won with seven runs. For the White Sox, we scored one, five, and then one, nine, zero after the All-Star break. So there, there's definitely been a drop-off on offense from June. And we knew that would happen, by the way. We're not saying that the Braves could have kept that pace on for the entire season because that would have been unrealistic. I mean, they were everybody was just hitting the cover off the ball. But right, we knew they were going to drop off a little bit, but not this much. Not this the much. Inconsistency, 
the inconsistency that been after the All Star break has been overwhelming right now, and it's like at the point where we need to do something about it before it becomes too late. You know what I mean? So that's what I'm worried about. So when you say do something about it, are you saying a trade deadline move, a possible lineup switch, move around the order? So what is your what are you going to do if you're Brian Snitker or Al Santopoulos? I'm thinking we need to get more power in that left field spot. And train and change up that order a little bit. I would change up. Uh, I would change up that order a little bit at the bottom between that six and that, between that five and seven to seven hole. I change that up a little bit. So you would. So how are you switching that up? Because right now, right now you've got uh, Sean. You, you you've got Sean Murphy. You've got uh, Marcelo Zuna, and then you've got Eddie Rosario. That's five seven. Okay, well, it's going to have to be. I put Sean Murphy in the four hole and put Olsen in that five hole. Oh, I, will, I, I, will. I wouldn't move Olsen. I think Ol, Olsen, Olsen's having a real, Olsen's having a really good season. I mean, I like I like him but out the floor. That's, it'll, that's help, it'll help Murphy out a little bit more. If you put him behind Riley and in front of and in front of Olsen, he'll get more pitches to look at. But because he got somebody – who in the six hole? Ozuna. See, Ozuna been he been he in his cold streak again. Yeah, he hasn't Ozuna been as good not, in the second half. He ain't been hitting as much right now. They're not giving Sean Murphy much to hit. So Sean Murphy okay. got oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, You know what I'm saying? saying? Yeah. So if you put him in front of if you put him in front of Olsen, he gonna see more pitches because Olsen have not let out had not let up so far. He still been he still been swinging a hot bat. So that'll yeah. help that'll help that out. And and if Ozzy if Ozzy be a little bit more patient at the plate, it'll help Acuna do his thing at the top. Hopefully, hopefully Oz, you know that homer that homer last night for Ozzy and and in in Boston will get him going because he had been really struggling. Actually, it had been Ozzy, Murphy, Ozuna, Eddie, and Orlando Arcia. All of them have been struggling at the same time since the All Star break, really. So when you have five five out of your nine guys struggling. That's that's what happens. You're not just you're just not gonna score as many runs. And that's what we've seen really. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. I'm about ready to go get our boy back from God doing Boston right now. I'm yeah. about ready to get him and bring him back right now. And there was that report. Yeah. There was that report that the Braves were interested in bringing back Adam Duvall and Adam Duvall hit a homer against us in Boston. I mean long he stay healthy he's that guy. Yeah. That's I the agree. only problem. If he don't if he get hurt and then he's out. But if he stays healthy, he's never let at that plate. So I'm, yeah. I'm willing. I'm willing to go get that guy right now. And I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure you won't have to spend that much for him, and put Eric, Eddie back in his reserve role, back in his reserve role because like too many games on his belt. He, he don't. He don't do so well. He don't well, do so high. Thing. That's the thing with Eddie Rosario. He's always been the streaky hitter. He was never going to be. He's. I don't think he's going to be as bad as he is right now for a longer period of time, but he was never going to be as good as he was in the NLCS in the playoffs in the, the year that we won the World Series. It just wasn't going to happen. And, and this has been Eddie's, Eddie's normal career. He's just a streaky hitter. You know, when he's on fire, he can carry your team. But when he's going like he is now, it's it's kind of rough to watch. And especially because uh, – and it's affecting his defense too. Defensively, Eddie has not been, been the best, to say the least, over the past few weeks. I know he really had a rough series uh, against the Diamondbacks. Uh, sorry, White Sox. So right. it was. But that's that's the kind of coaching style you know Snicker plays. Where he he's a laid back coach. He's willing to sit back and let it come. I mean, feel like it's all gonna come together. I'm more of a hands on type. You know what I mean? I want to. Oh, did we did we lose Will? I think, but but yeah, the Bra- Braves. We're, we we've discussed the offense now. In terms of the pitching side of things, it oh well there we go. Oh, he's back. All right, well, oh man, saying? screen yard, screen yard to kick me out. <laughs> I said, uh, we know we know this the type of style like what Snicker like the coach, he's more of a laid back, patient coach. I mean, like to believe everything gonna come back around, just give a chance to, to work itself out. I'm more of a hand on type coach. What can I what can I do to, you know, fix this situation? What can we work on type? But that's what a lot of these teams don't do a lot of these days. Like, 
you got to treat practice like in-game situations. You know what I mean? So when you in those game time situation, it's like second nature. It's like you don't have to think about it. You just react. You got to build that muscle membrane. You got to. And I don't think a lot of these coaches do that right now. I know we don't do it. You can tell. You can tell in the game we don't do that. Oh, but, but yeah, like we've we've saw we've seen the Braves' offense just slip a little bit. I don't want anybody to make believe that we think that the Braves need to make a major shift. We need to go out and sign like a star bat or a crazy good bat. But one bench no, piece we, we, we have Charlie bat. Coberson. We have Charlie Coberson on the bench just well, just sitting there. He hasn't really played. He's basically like a mascot, just a, a club club morale type of person up there in the dugout. So even he could be replaced if if we need if we need some offensive depth. Right. We just need we just need a consistent bat. We don't need an all-star bat. We need a consistent bat. That's all we need. Yeah. That's all we need. Now we did enough in the first half to build enough cushion to not be so panicked right now. But hey, we need to work on it before that cushion started to diminish. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, we are te- right we now, it. right now we are ten games above the Phillies. They they are on a currently uh two game win streak. We are on a two game losing streak with that sweep in Boston that we just suffered. But on the pitching side of things, well, first of all, let's go, let's go over the trades. We've got, we've got Pierce Johnson from the Rockies who made his Braves debut in that Boston series. What did you think which of was, I Which like was him. a mistake. That was a mistake. I felt they should have let Snick, uh, Strider finish that in and out. I... I think you trust your ace to get out that end. You trust him to get out that end. I disagree because it was unraveling. I mean, he allowed up. He was cruising. Then he allowed up a homer, a walk, and then another hit. And and at not 80 pitches, I think what, at that point, you're like, you're cruising, right? You're on autopilot. Then you all, all of a sudden run into trouble in that seventh inning. And to me, I think we've seen a lot of those times where pitchers can get unraveled and it can get ugly. And I was fine with Snickers' pull, decision to pull him. But – I like I like Pierce Johnson of what I see what I saw from him. The stuff, the slider was really tight. I really liked his slider. But there's there's definitely there's definitely something to to be said for the importance of defense. And when you see when you saw Ozzy didn't make that play at second, that could have been a potential inning ending double play. Justin Turner was able to extend uh, to take the lead with Boston off uh, with the double off the Green Monster, and then you had Adam Duvall homering to the opposite field in the eighth inning to really seal the door, and then Kenley Jackson slamming that door shut in the ninth inning with the save. So, you yeah, we gave we gave that game away. So you see you you see the you see the importance of defense right there with Ozzy not being able to make that play at second base. It was a soft. It was only hit seventy eight miles per hour, but. It was a short hop, and normally I think Ozzy makes that play. He, I'm sure he was kicking himself for it. It wasn't that, a routine play thing, by any means. That's another thing too, Mike. We've been a little shaky on defense lately. Yeah, I, I will. We've I will been agree a little shaky on defense, and I don't, I don't know what's going on. We need to get our feet back up under. I don't I know what they did down there at that All Star break. Hey, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> I hope that. Uh, I hope we see a, a different Braves. Type of different Braves type of defense tonight because yeah, like you said, the, the we've seen you know Orlando with that weird play, Orlando Arcia throwing to third base, and then Austin Riley wasn't able to catch it. That that brings back uh, from a couple of games ago. You've got Ozzy's defense, you've got Eddie's defense in left field after the break hasn't been good. Uh, Sean, well, Sean Murphy's defense has been excellent. Same with Ronald Acuna and Michael Harris. Those guys and Austin Riley. Has had a little bit of a tough time too, but Acuna, right. Murphy, and Olsen really those guys. Yeah, Olsen, never especially about Olsen with them ground ball. I'm scared every time ground ball comes in. Wait, well, uh, well, he had one error, he, he had one error, but I'm I think Olsen's defense has been phenomenal this season overall. I think Acuna, Murphy, Harris, and Olsen, their defense, and Orlando Arcia's has been phenomenal overall this season. But Arcia, you know, Arcia Albies, same with Riley, Arcia Albies, uh, Eddie Rosario. Those guys have been a little iffy, uh, a <laughs> little iffy to start. start hey, Olsen, Olsen had a couple of iffy plays too. Now he ain't had a couple of. No, he yeah he's he's had it, but overall I think I think this season has been way better than last season defensively. He he didn't start the season well defensively last year. 
Now, Austin Riley, he's been playing gold glove defense over there. Even though his bat was cold for a minute, that defense been showing up. Yeah, and that's that's what you, you never want your offensive slump to impact their defense. And Austin Riley is doing the exact opposite of that. He's been he, he was tearing off tearing the cover off the ball in, up in Milwaukee when he had five straight games by Homer, and he was and he was playing great defense even before that because before that he was really struggling. And and when you can still contribute on the field like that, similar to what Michael Harris was doing at the beginning of the season, it keeps your it keeps your confidence up, and then that's how you gain your bat back and and the skills to to be confident in the plate on the defense. Right. Because your team, your team can deal with the bat being cold for a minute, but sloppy defense, they they will not tolerate that. Yeah. So overall, what were what were your thoughts on Pierce Johnson when we saw him in Boston? Oh, I'm I think he looked I think he looked good. Besides yeah, like the him. fact that I thought like I really think Snicker you used him too early. He wanted to test his toy out real quick. You know, he, he got that brand new package in from in the mail, you know. He wanted to test him out. But I really I really think he should have had Scribe to stick that out because that's all that's all the playoffs gonna be about. It's gonna be about those tough situations. It's gonna be those situations where you've been cruising for a minute and you come across this 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 ending where it seemed like the batters got your number. You're gonna have to figure out a way to get through that. You know what I'm saying? So is that like is that like I think he should have really just kept him in there at that point of time. Okay. Yeah, I disagree, but I see. What oh you're yeah, saying. hey, hey, Miss Pam, how you doing? But there's, there's definitely, there's definitely some merit to that, though. I, I can see, you know, Strider in, in the playoffs, he's gonna have to be in that tough situation. So yeah, overall, this pen is getting healthier. We've got AJ Minter coming back. Max Fried's in a second rehabil- re- rehabil- t- rehabilitation start as well. Unfortunately, though. Max Fried was actually – he had a setback, which is – it was just an illness. Like, it wasn't a, an injury-related setback or a physical ailment. It was just an illness. Unfortunately, he was scratched and had to leave early from that from that second rehabilitation start. Hopefully, yeah, he can well, make that and then get back to this team as soon as possible because we're getting healthier. A.J. Minter, like I said, Dylan Lee still has to come back. Jesse Chavez and Nick Anderson are a little bit of a ways hey, we away. We might need to go – we might need to go get Luke Jackson. He's been showing out this but, year. Yeah. Luke Jackson's been really good for the Giants. <laughs> Luke Jackson's been really good. I don't think the Giants are going to sell, though. They, they're they definitely in the wild card race. They've had a good year. So I don't think they would sell. It'd be good, though. I'd, I'd love to have Luke Jackson. I do right. think we get one more big arm, though. We we made a, a relatively big splash with Rice and Iglesias right at the buzzer last deadline. I think we make a similar move here. I don't know if it'll be right at the buzzer. But hey, a similar to type of le- high leverage arm. I think that comes through. Put Soroka in the bullpen. We'll be all right. We'll be set. Put him in the bullpen. Let him get let him get that, you know what I'm saying? That stretch him out in the bullpen a little bit. Get him back to his starting rotation. I put I put Soroka down there. Get some good innings out of him. Uh Pamela asked, what about Tyler Matzek? Matzek, unfortunately, he's out for the he's season. He's not gonna be this year. Yeah, he's not gonna yeah, be that this year. He's out for the season because uh due to Tommy John surgery last offseason. You know, when he had his struggles, when he has his, had his struggles late last season and into the playoffs, into the playoffs, they they he went to he went to get examined and he found out he needed Tommy John surgery and unfortunately, yeah, he he won't be he won't be pitching this year. Definitely miss him though. Those high level situations and a lefty without without Minter and Lee, we really have no lefties in the pen right now that are that are very reliable. So, and we and we DFA Lucas Lifty as well. So there's, we don't really have much. This pen is thin. That's what I'll say. And when we get healthier, it'll be back to normal. I'm confident about that. But how long can that? How long can we survive and tread water until the pen gets back to its full strength? I think we need to answer that question with a, a high leverage arm at the deadline. Hopefully a lefty. I wouldn't mind going in again a rolled a rolled as Chapman from the Royals having a great season. I mean we 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 haven't really had a guy like that in our pen in a while. We have Ben Heller who. Really throws he throws hard, but he's nowhere old as Chapman. And I oh, think Oh man, we get Chapman. That's a game seller because that, that movie yeah, he, relates you to the eight home. Yeah, I agree. We could we could close chat we could close Chapman, we can close with Iglesias. Even heck, even Minter has closing experience. Obviously nah, that wouldn't almost, be almost that wouldn't be I'm, no 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 no. I'm not saying Minter could close. <laughs> I'm not saying Minter would close. I'm saying 
right. you've got three guys with ninth inning experience, and you've got them lined up seventh, eighth, ninth. I mean, that's that's right, right. great because they know the pressure of that ninth inning. B- bring that into the seventh and eighth. You've got Nick Anderson when he comes back, hopefully soon. You know, he was put on the sixty day IL, so he's still hey, a ways the, away. But that's hopefully the he comes right back now, and in the playoffs. He You're even right. had ninth inning experience closing for the for the Rays. So we've got a lot of guys in this veteran bullpen that have closing experience. We just need them to get healthy, and I think we'll be all right. You might have said something. Then. They need to go get Chapman. Go get Chapman and go and go get get our boy from Boston. We'd be good. <laughs> yeah, I I I'd love that deadline. To be honest, that'd be awesome. Any other any other overarching points before we uh, preview the Brewers, Brewers series starting tonight? No, nah, I'm just along for the ride. Let's go. All right. So tonight, Yanni Chirinos makes his makes his Braves de- debut. Now, Adrian Hauser. We just faced Adrian Hauser in the first game uh, of the Brewers series. I th- I believe it was the first game. Uh, what's it, Hauser? Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if it was the first game of the Brewers series, but it was one of the game, games in the Brewers series. And he no, had, I'm thinking it was the uh, second game because it was him and uh, Strider facing that one. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, you're correct. The Braves, because that was Sal, that was Sal, yes, you're right. That was because that was Sal Freelich's debut. And, and boy, did that guy have a – Great debut. I didn't need to say this right now. Sal Freelich looks like he's going to be a great player in this league. Not a lot of power, but similar to like a Luis Arise type guy who can get the who can get a lot of contact, great bat to ball speed, not going to strike out a lot, and his defense was phenomenal. So I'll say that about it, that young Brewers rookie. He's he looks amazing. But yeah, you were correct. Adrian Hauser started the second game of this, the Brewers series in which we lost four to three. Now. We yeah, which we gave out. up. We had that game too. We gave we that did. game. We, we did have that game, and then and then Sal Freelich happened. <laughs> but <laughs> we struck out a lot that game. Adrian Adrian Hauser is not a strikeout pitcher, but he we had a ton of strikeouts that game. Which you know, generally homers and strikeouts that's not the way you're going to win ball games, and that's what happened to us. Austin Riley's three run homer was the only was the only runs that we scored that that game and that's, that's was the only offense in that game is three run homer right yeah i mean we struck out 14 times against a non strikeout pitcher that's that's that, you're going to lose the game I'm, if that happens when you don't put the ball in play bad things happen yeah that's what i'm talking about like working on in game situations at practice we're not doing it cuz we got two minute strikeout we're 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 too sorry at runners in score position. It's ridiculous, man. I'm like, for a team to be this high up in the stand and to be that sorry in runners in score position, it's, it's baffling. You know, <laughs> it, just, it just shows you how many homers we didn't hit this season because, like, we're running in score position. We are terrible. Yeah. And in the, well, we're actually not that bad. Yes. Uh, if you look at if you look, we're at, not we're not going to talk about the the old paper track. We talk about the eye test. What your eyes telling you, Mikey? What have you seen? The eye test should go in conjunction with the stats. You shouldn't, <laughs> right. you shouldn't right. look at just right. one thing here and then look at another <laughs> thing here. You like it's not all doom and gloom with the Braves and running some scoring positions. But yes, we've been struggling lately. I'm just that's that's what I'll say. I'm not gonna say. Okay, you know the Braves runners was running score says, Okay, two fifty five average. You know we're we're okay, but uh, uh, but I also will say that yes, we've been struggling lately, but I don't think that it's I don't think it's one thing that we can say. Okay, it's time to panic. We need to do something about this because that that that'll happen. It, baseball is like that. Over one hundred sixty two games. I know I know we could we we want to score every single runner that gets on base. We don't want to leave a man on base ever in the in the game but that's just not gonna happen i don't think it's time to panic too much with this offense but i do think we need to cut down on our strikeouts because that has raised after the all-star break i think that is hey, something that i am a little alarmed about for sure i can live with not scoring everybody but at least be 50 percent on the scoring situation give yourself a shot 
50 wait 50 percent is a 500 average that's not gonna happen hey that's that's what's running this score 50 you can do 50 percent no okay wait. okay give me give me 40 percent Give Will, what teams do you know with a 500 average <laughs> with runners in scoring position? Hey, but look, but look, look, the runners, in, you got to think about the runners in scoring position we be having. We be having a runner on uh, first and second with no outs and don't score a run. That is terrible. All you have to do is you can butt them over into scoring position. You know what I'm saying? Butt them over. You have runners in second and third. Then you can pop fly a run in. It's that simple. So – yeah, I see what you're saying. Will, you know, Will, I'm going to have you guess guess the, the Braves' average with runners in scoring position at what rank they are in the league. I'm going to say that. You already just said that. Everything about 250 or something? No, that was that was just that was just uh, a hypothetical. I would say, let's say you're batting 250. But but what I know, I know the exact number. What do you think it ranks in the league, and what do you think the number is? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say we were all about probably like 280, and we probably rank like six in the league. We're 266, number one in the league by 12 points. What? Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Will Will runners in scoring position? That that number will almost never go above 300 for a whole season. Never. It's I I I don't remember the last time I've ever seen that. So that. So that that's what I'm saying. Like, there's 266 for the year. That's amazing. We're, we're, that no wonder we have one of the most historic. Okay, no, nah, I'm not talking about a whole. I'm not talking about a whole season. No, nah, I know we're not gonna have a 500 average the whole season. That's, but, that's but, but 266 is insanely good. Insane. Okay, by the baseball numbers, yeah, I guess, but that's yeah, it is. Well, we're, we're talking baseball. <laughs> It's just like what twenty, what twenty five percent? Come on, like that's yeah. crazy. That's, that's crazy. Well, that's just how hard baseball is, to be honest. Right, twenty five percent get you get you uh twenty million a year. <laughs> but yeah, it's a hey, but but the reason it is because what I was talking about, man. They don't practice a lot of in game situations at practice. That's why a lot of these batters be then they have you know a lot of these batters be cold. They don't, you know, they don't use they. They got an in, they got an in stadium batting cage down there. They can have players go down there who ain't get been in the game go go practice a couple of swings down there. It just they don't utilize the situation that they have, you know. So I'm just, I just think different. I think differently, you know. That's what it is. Because most of the time, I mean, if you look at it, a batting average for the MLB, you know, you want it to hover around 300. You know, if you if you hit 280. With 30 homers and 100 RBIs, that's an insanely good season. Right. But think about it. That's you're only hitting. You're only getting a hit 28 percent of your at bats. Yeah, that's <laughs> I mean, crazy. This, this this is a hard sport. It hitting is. You gotta have great. Opinion, in my you gotta opinion, have great it, hand eye coordination. You gotta have. a baseball is probably the hardest skill to do in any sport. I think. I think that that goes. That is that is I'll, I will die on that hill. That it's not the hardest sport, but individualized skill hitting a baseball from a major league pitcher is the hardest thing to do in any in any sport to ever exist. Yeah, and because think, of the ball movement, the ball movement. Exactly. So when you think about twenty eight percent, and that's a great number, you got you got to think in terms of in terms of those numbers, not like fifty percent or forty percent, because I think those numbers are unrealistic. Now that could happen for a couple games. But over a yeah, week, that's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about in in a couple of series. Give me that a couple of series. You ain't got to do the whole year. I mean, give me that a couple of series. Let me see that. Yeah, that's what we were doing in June. We were we were near three hundred. We were near three hundred for a month in with runners in scoring position. That's what that was why we were scoring so many runs. And, and that's why and that's why that uh that average the yearly average is up now. That's when I say the numbers can be skewed. Because we could have had a good month, like you just said, and what we what we were hitting the cover off the ball, then come down the next month and we ain't doing too much. So it's just like we need. I I'd rather you do the consistency. Give me a consistent two eighty or something like two two seventy. I'll take two seventy. Give me a consistent two seventy. I'll take that over 
you you doing give, giving me a bite over 300 or something like that you know what i'm saying let's give me consistency okay. like like the dodge like the dodger team we used to face all them um when you go to play colorado rockets at they place facing them like that that give me, give me that consistency where you know it's gonna be a dog fight when you play them gotcha Last, the last series we faced with the Brewers, we won. Uh, obviously, it wasn't it wasn't like a landslide. It was a it was, uh, it was a crazy it was a crazy series. But with or no, sorry, with, with the Brewers, what, what, what am I saying? Um, for the for the Brewers, you had Devin, you have Devin Williams in that bullpen. You have Joel Piamps. You have um, what's his name? Pe- Pedro Figueroa, the the sinker, the sinker baller. So these guys. These guys are have a really good pen. Now, we we won that series because we were able to score a few runs late. Can we score enough now? Can we score enough runs to not have to put as much pressure on the offense to deal with that really good Brewers bullpen, especially with Devin Williams at the end there? That is going to be the key to key to this series for me. Let's get ahead, try to get ahead early so that the Brewers can't use their ace quality arms late in the ball game in the bullpen. Right. Let's not all here. let's not let's not score all the runs in the first inning and be cold the rest of the game. I'm so yeah. tired of that. Come on, man. Yeah, that's that's my key to the series. You you just gotta keep scoring throughout the game. Give give pitches different looks. What about what about you as far as your uh, an individual key to the series? My key to the series is just keep the line moving. Keep the line moving. Stop swinging for the fences. We, I look at the game. I be looking at so many games like that. They swinging for the fences, and it just, it be having me cussing the TV out. You know, I, you know, I ain't trying to buy another TV. I'm just, 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 just be patient up there. Be patient. Make the pitcher, make the pitcher beat you. Make him beat you. Or right. any anything else uh, before we wrap it up here? Nah, we we ain't spoken on everything, man. All right. Unless you're just trying to stay on longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that being said, we're going to end it there. Hope hope you guys enjoyed t- today's episode of Georgia Sports Nation. Make sure to tune in next week, 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be back next week with more Hawks and Braves content. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. Peace.